This video about geographic determinism is sponsored by Warfunder. Warfunder is a multiplayer combat simulator with over 2,000 historically accurate vehicles and planes. All vehicles have their historically accurate models down to the nicest little detail, including my favorite ones, the MiG-21. The realism of the various aircraft and vehicle models contribute to a highly immersive gameplay experience and are also really nice to look at. War Thunder is a cross-platform title, meaning that if you're on a PC like myself, you get to dominate all over all those Xbox and PlayStation people and show them their place at the bottom of the food chain. The detailed damage models mean that you have to calculate where you aim and shoot and can't just brainlessly shoot at everything. The customizable skins feature also permit you to customize your vehicle to your own personal liking and the range of historical vehicles available span over an entire century right back to the earliest tanks and planes of the 1920s. And best of all, you can join this game for free. If you join the game through the link in the description, you will also get a bonus pack that includes a premium account, premium boosters and premium vehicles. Many thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video and now let's get into it. Geography is the foundation of one of the best hypotheses to try to explain historical and political developments. Geography is not something that you can doubt, it is a physical reality. You can't just walk up to a mountain and claim that mountains are social constructs and therefore the physical barriers they create are not real. Well, you can, but you will be laughed at. But most importantly, the study of how geography shapes society, its conclusions as presented by geographic determinists, more often than not, are correct. It is very rare for a geographic determinist to get something wrong. I am going to try to critique geographic determinism somewhat in this video, but before I even do so, I want to point out to you all that I am not outright dismissing it entirely. As mentioned before, the geographic determinist is most of the time correct. I am mainly making this video to explain to geographic determinist critics of mine, who often voice their criticisms in the comments, why I am not a geographic determinist. It is difficult to argue against geographic determinism, in particular against the favorite case study of the geographic determinist, Russia. Whatever your approach of research, interpretation or your biases may be, it cannot be denied that much of Russia's social, economic and political development was driven by how its society interacted with the vast geography of its landmass and the harsh winters. A while ago I made a video presenting and going through the Russian political development from a perspective outside of geography, but I could also simply not avoid mentioning the importance of geography. There are certain established points made by geographic determinists that are almost always true. Let's take one of these examples. Mountains are great barriers. They are the reason why some societies don't interact and influence each other. Mountains are great refuges. As such, they preserve cultures and societies who seek to escape the influence of larger civilizations that reside in flatlands and coastlines beyond the mountains. But what happens when you find a region with social developments that contradict these assumptions? In the Andes of South America, you will find the dominating civilization of pre-Columbian South America, the Inca, who constructed their civilization in the mountains, while those who sought to escape its influence sought to do so in jungles, coastlines and flatlands. Throughout pre-colonial South America, you will find that many civilizations contradict our Eurasian and African assumptions of geography and society. You will find few civilizations established around river basins, but many in geographic environments that many of us in Europe, Africa and Asia would consider as hostile. The most predominant civilizations of pre-Columbian America were civilizations that specialized in settling, building and prospering on geography that was difficult by Eurasian and African standards. Their societies simply favored such conditions. Which raises the question, what is the more important and deciding factor here? Is it geography? Or is it how we as societies and cultures perceive and interact with geography? Let's go to Southeast Asia to discuss an example of the conflict between interpretations for geography and society. In the jungles of Cambodia, you will find the city of Angkor Wat, a civilization that we know little about. Nobody knows why this city was abandoned. Ancient and medieval Cambodians recorded their history by writing them on palm leaves. These only survived up to a hundred years and then rotted away. They had to continuously be copied. Writing history was a religious ceremony for the medieval Khmer in accordance to Hindu and later Buddhist concepts of life, decay and renewal. Every century, monks would copy the texts from rotting leaves onto fresh leaves and form a chain of historical records that passed through time in a cycle. But that chain was interrupted in the 13th century. 
And because of this, a large volume of Cambodian history that happens to coincide with the abandoning of Angkor Wat is not known to us. 19th century French historians claimed there was a sudden civilizational collapse. Most modern historians believe that Angkor did not abruptly fall, but was abandoned in a slow and gradual decline over the course of two to three centuries from the 1300s to 1600s. The geographic historian will point out that we know that the abandonment of Angkor coincided with an increase of seafaring trade by Southeast Asian civilizations and a consequent shift in socio-economic power structures that benefited those living in coastal regions. Beginning in the 1400s, the seafaring trading kingdoms of Asia and East Africa rose in power, while the landlocked kingdoms based on agricultural wealth all began to decline. But we also know that the abandonment of Angkor Wat coincided with a religious change in Buddhist theology. Angkor was built as a monastery close to the river Kabal Spin, which is considered a sacred river by Hindus and Buddhists. Much of the inscriptions of the temples and their statues, as well as the many monuments, are testaments to a society organized around religion. The entire narrative of rise and fall is wrong. And to understand this, I will point at this, the great sleeping Buddha of Angkor Wat. Why? Because archaeologists have conclusively proven that this Buddha statue was built in the 1600s, a full 300 years after what many still believe was the collapse of Angkor. So how was this massive Buddha put in this place in a society that supposedly no longer existed? That's because it did still exist. Starting in the 1300s, there were no longer great stone temples being built, but huge flat stone basins. And what archaeologists figured out is that these stone temples were abandoned in favor of building huge wood temples, which over time rotted away. And it is very likely that this was done deliberately. Because by the 1300s, Mahayana Buddhism, the faith of those who built the stone temples, declined, and Theravada Buddhism became the dominant faith. Theravada Buddhism emphasizes the temporariness of life. In many ways, it rejects grand expressions of faith in favor of modest practitioning of faith. Attempting to leave a mark in the present through the construction of stone temples is seen as folly. Everything is a cycle of life and death, and one ought to accept and appreciate that cycle. Temples in Angkor consequently started being built with wood, and they were allowed to rot away with time. To the Theravada Buddhist, no man-made thing can be sacred. A temple built by men is as temporary as those men. The faith is what matters. The temple rots away, and a new temple is constructed. We also started seeing the practice of writing on palm leaves dominate, while writing on stone was increasingly abandoned. The large stone temples were allowed to be overgrown with forests, symbolizing the new temporality that the new Buddhist theology emphasized. All of this was done deliberately as an expression of the predominant religious norms of the time. There's a question to be made about what has the highest impact here in the decline and abandonment of Angkor. Was it the society or was it the geography? Does geography shape society or does our society develop despite our surrounding geography? The reason why I love giving Anchor as an example is because neither me nor the geographic determinists will be able to give you an answer. The history of Anchor from the 1300s to 1600s is a known unknown. We will never know what happened. Anchor is a great illustration of how history is not just about interpreting what we know, but also interpreting what we do not know, and thereby keeping a conversation like this one going. To give another example, oceans used to be deep, large pits of certain doom and death. With the exception of the Polynesians, most civilizations did not know how to navigate deep oceans. We tended to do coast hopping around smaller oceans and along coasts, until the Portuguese invented the caravel, compass and cross staff, thereby enabling deep sea navigation. The way we interacted with the geography of oceans thereby completely changed. The oceans were suddenly no longer deep, gloomy pits of certain death, but free highways leading all around the world. So is the geography of oceans really something that shapes our societies, or is it more how we as societies engage with the geography of oceans? The geographic determinist will tell you that the Atlantic coastlines of Portugal is what made the Portuguese a seafaring society of excellent sailors and navigators. But those who see societal developments as the main drive will point at technology and ancient Arab maps which were translated into Portuguese in the 1400s and given to the Portuguese. 
The geographic determinist will say that the geography of coastlines is what furthered the development of that technology in the first place. And then someone like me will point at the Ottoman blockade on European trade. Then the geographic determinist will jump in to claim Anatolian geography made that Ottoman blockade possible in the first place. Then someone like me will claim that the Ottoman takeover of Roman institutions of governance is what enabled them in the first place. And so we are here, we end up stuck with a chicken or egg debate. Another example is China. The geographic determinist will tell you that the rough nature and constant flooding of the Yellow River resulted in Chinese civilization developing state structures earlier than most to facilitate the management of the river through the collective actions organized to maintain dams and irrigation. While I will emphasize that competition among warring states are what shaped the early civilizations of China in a process of finding the more efficient state structure to fight war. In Egypt, the geographic determinist will tell you that the calm flow of the Nile, which requires no large collective social efforts to control, combined with the isolation of the Nile River Valley, cut off from invaders by deserts, ocean and mountains, resulted in Egypt becoming a stagnant society that didn't innovate and consequently was overrun and conquered by outsiders. While those like me who see social causes as the reason will argue that the absolutism of the pharaonic system combined with the well-recorded ancient Egyptian cultural hostility towards any and all outsiders is what caused the stagnation and shunning of innovation by the early Egyptian civilizations. Another populant variant of the geography argument is that of ecology, that is to say, the environment within which societies develop. This comes from Jared Diamond, who argued that the origins of modern inequality stems from a larger availability and variation of domesticable animals and plant species in the Fertile Crescent, allowing the inhabitants of it to settle quicker, develop complex social structures first, and through such innovate faster than other civilizations. The Fertile Crescent, in Diamond's view, helped kickstart the prosperity of Mediterranean civilization and consequent European prosperity. However, Pre-Columbian America cuts through this hypothesis as well. The Aztecs and Inca were more prosperous than the Spaniards who conquered them. Jared Diamond's thesis would imply that this prosperity would have continued with the adopting of the technologies imported from Europe. Yet the exact opposite happened. After being conquered by the Spanish, Central and South America were slower to adopt modern technologies, modern economic structures and modern political institutions they became poorer, and by the mid-1800s, the balance of wealth in the two American continents shifted, with North America becoming wealthier, while South America became poorer. Jared Diamond also famously argued that technologies, domesticated animals, crop species and innovations travel faster from west to east and east to west than they do from south to north and north to south. This is simply not true. It is funny enough contradicted by the geography hypothesis itself, namely by how oceans are free highways that make trade and transport easy, no matter where and in what direction or whatever pole. And this pointed out by Dan Achimoglia and James Robinson, when looking at the geographic distribution of ancestral animals of cattle and pigs, we notice that their wide distribution beyond the Fertile Crescent contradicts Jared Diamond's theory. As mentioned before, this debate between what it is, geography or society, can often devolve in a what came first, the chicken or egg debate. To return to mountains and the role they play as refuges, the bread and butter of political science is the comparative study, which is to take two countries with similar structures and outlook and compare them to see why one may do something better than the other. Switzerland and Lebanon are two such countries. They may not be obviously similar, but they are when you take a deeper look. Both are mountainous regions that through their mountains functioned as refuges for persecuted peoples and minorities in the region. Those peoples formed different communities, creating a patchwork society of different groups. If anything, the Lebanese geography is superior to the Swiss geography as it provides a nice, long, juicy coastline compared to the landlocked Swiss. Yet, despite all those similarities, Switzerland is one of the best functioning states in the world, while Lebanon is one of the most dysfunctional states in the world. So similar, yet still entirely different. I grant the geography his powers of determining the foundation of development based on geography, but the geographer cannot decipher or explain what that development ultimately will be, and where it takes the peoples inhabiting that geography, which, I believe, is entirely decided by society. 
The geography cannot help us understand how we can reform Lebanon to be more like Switzerland. Only a study of institutions and policies can do that. Finally, I would like to give as food for thought the favorite example of the institutional economist to argue against geographic determinism, South America. I often have the suspicion that many geographic determinists, especially from North America and Europe, do not even know South American geography. Many geographic determinists will tell you that South America has a bad geography, but this is simply not true. Stretching across southern Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay and Argentina, you will find the Parana Basin, the single largest freshwater reservoir in the world. Fed by the Amazon, it creates an enormous stretch of fertile agricultural lands and feeds a network of navigable rivers called the Rio de la Plata, leading into juicy natural harbors at the Atlantic coastlines. This geographic region has all the exact same geographic benefits of the Mississippi Valley and the American Midwest. The Andes are filled with an enormous abundance of mineral wealth, and the climate is mild and conducive for living and agriculture. Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay, in fact, as a collective geographic region, is by the standards of the geographic determinist, one of the single best geographies in the world. But there is not much to show for it, because corruption, mismanagement, dumb foreign meddling, lack of cooperation and dysfunctional politics has over centuries ensured that the peoples of South America were never able to take advantage of and prosper from their highly beneficial geography. All of these are political problems, therefore the causes and solutions lie in policy and not in just studying geography. So, to address, finally, the geographic determinist in the views and comments. I am not someone who intends to just outright dismiss you. There's a good reason why I favor your critiques in the comment sections. I enjoy reading geographic determinists. I am not making my videos with the intention of discrediting geographic determinism. I would just like to invite you to engage in that chicken or egg debate with me over what it is that matters more, the society or the geography. Thank you for watching. Since I am at almost 500,000 subscribers, I'll make it a habit to shout out smaller creators at the end of some of my videos. Ravignon, a history and economics YouTuber, is working on a video about how neoliberal economics and economic integration failed to create peace between Palestine and Israel, and how this failure may point to the limitations of neoliberal foreign policy as a means of conflict resolution. A link to his channel is in the description, and I hope you check it out. Thank you again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to use the link in the description to play War Thunder. If you want to support my channel, you can do so through becoming a patron, a channel member, donating through Coffee or PayPal, or by just sharing the video around. If you want to discuss the video with the community, don't forget to join the Discord server. All the links are in the description. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you all soon again.